uh, in 1824, uh, at the age of 30, he made it to Rome after spending a couple of months in Venice. Now this uh, is a painting in the Louvre, but uh, it's believed, uh, we can't be absolutely sure about this, that it was painted in Rome. And so this is his very early manner. I think what you see here is a kind of generic Baroque style. And I would care, and we're gonna, uh, could we, Marissa, could we have the, the other one on? Great. Uh, this is from the same period. This is, this is. Uh, I'm afraid this is, re this is reversed. But let's not worry about it. Uh, this is um, uh, in the Vatican. The one on the right. Uh, it's from 1629. That would make him 35. Uh, I would characterize both of these painting as uh, uh, being a kind of a glib, uh, a baroque style. Uh, tremendous amount of breadth and height. Uh, but uh, a very uh, uh, vague uh, space and uh, not much, practically no depth. Uh, Poussin was very disappointed by the reception of this painting. Uh, but you know, uh, there was a lot of competition in Rome. There was Pietro da Cartona, there was Guercino, um, there was uh, Guido Reni. Uh, it helped to be Italian. It helped to grow, grow there. You were surrounded by the greatest uh, art uh, of the Western tradition, uh, the most wonderful teachers. Uh, those painters had tremendous bravura and dash, and uh, uh, f they were full of surprise that they do very wild things. Uh, I think that um, uh, Poussin, here, here's another. Uh, painting a little earlier, uh, again, which shows this a very crowded, uh, very uh, 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 pressed up uh, to the picture plane. Uh, I think um, Poussin had to uh, uh, re-examine his, uh, uh, re get his bearings. Uh, I think what he decided to do, this is sheer speculation on my part, he knew uh, he had tremendous application, tremendous uh, ability to work. I think he decided uh, to, uh, if he couldn't um, uh, do these, uh, uh, all these uh, dashing, uh, 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 bold uh, Italian inventions, he would do something that only he could do. And uh, you, I've, you've just seen a number of them. The difference is astonishing, isn't it? What is so interesting about this, uh, of course, Poussin is considered one of the greatest French painters of all time. If he had stayed in Paris, he would have employed um, a generic uh, Baroque style. Uh, he wouldn't have had to grow. But in going to Rome, he actually became the quintessentially French painter. He could have never done that in Paris uh, because uh, what he did was, we, uh, and we can't go back into the uh, 16th century uh, spatial uh, modes, but um, he really looks back 100 years and uh, painters like uh, Raphael. Now, isn't this amazing? This is, uh, uh, this is from the late 30s. This is at the Louvre. This is the uh, gathering of manna by the Israelites. Now, I would imagine him as setting himself the problem of the most absolutely smooth movement from foreground to middle ground to background. Look at that. It's, it's really astonishing. And uh, uh, the, what is also so amazing about this is the sheer number of figures, uh, all those fingers and toes. You know, in Baroque painting, uh, you can cover up a lot of uh, things with uh, some sensational drapery. Uh, Poussin never evaded a difficulty. In fact, he seemed to welcome them and thr thrive on them. Now, this is one of the joys and, and great masterpieces of the Louvre. Uh, it's called The Inspiration of the Poet. And there's a good deal of debate uh, about the date of this, but it's, um, it's back there. Uh, you know, uh, some people put it as early as 1629, and uh, which would put it all before these emblem and uh, ground plans uh, we saw. Uh, this, wouldn't you think that, I mean, you could forgive anyone for settling for this. This, uh, and of course, you can see the Venetian influence. Uh, 
look at, uh, uh, you, you'll see that um, uh, this, uh, these gods, uh, you, you see, we don't know whether she's the muse or Minerva, but look at the way she's leaning and uh, her legs, uh, uh, one leg crosses another. She's very relaxed, isn't she? And look at Apollo here. Uh, uh, I want you to savor this gesture because I'm going to evoke it, evoke it later. You see the way his arm is resting on that lyre. He's pointing to this paper. You see, here is the poet. He's about to, uh, 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 inspiration is about to descend upon him. He's got the laurels uh, will be put on his head. He's getting himself all worked up into a frenzy. But you see, uh, the gods don't work. We, mankind works. We work. Now I would point out to you, caution, you see all this dark area up here? All of this along here added. So this would have all been a, and a there's been some addition here. Uh, this would have been a much tighter uh, uh, painting. And again, this uh, w way up uh, close, living large. Now here's a, uh, this again uh, is fits in at the same time as, well, actually, th this one's later. This is about 1639. This is uh, 1631. Uh, this, has, this is the plague of Asdod, and it had great contemporary relevance. There was a horrible plague going on in the north of Italy. Uh, in Venice, one third of the population died in uh, 1630. It was a population of 180,000. Imagine they lost 60,000 people. So that had a great revel uh, uh, relevance. But here this, um, look at this wonderful uh, deep space. And uh, it's, I can't emphasize enough how incredibly difficult it is to have so many figures. And they never, it never gets lumpy. Uh, there's space in between all of them. Uh, this requires the most amazing deliberation and, of course, also the most careful uh, use of color. Uh, look at these wonderful golds and these slight blues. Uh, here you see a figure she's dyed. She's turned gray. Um, but um, you couldn't imagine a greater difference between earlier and later style, could you? Now, <laughs> uh, this is uh, when uh, I was asked to uh, uh, give a lecture on my work, I absolutely without speaking, I blurted out, oh, I'd like to talk about Poussin. And um, Graham Nixon, a uh, big smile came over his face, and I thought to myself, aha, another Poussin fan. Well, uh, it turns out there are three paintings I've done over the years which have Poussin in the title. And this is Poussin's birthday. Uh, it's in uh, uh, the museum in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, the uh, Carnegie uh, Museum. I called it Poussin's birthday because I thought it was very, very celebratory and uh, joyous. And uh, Poussin because uh, it was so complicated. Now, this was done in, uh, the Poussin's birthday was done in 83. And uh, the painting on the right was done in 86. And it's in the Albright Knox at, uh, in uh, Buffalo. And uh, the Poussin's birthday is seven feet by 10 feet. So it's big. And uh, the, the one on the right is called Consolidated Light and Power. I hope it's keeping them warm up in Buffalo tonight. Uh, it's 81 inches by 108 inches. Now, I think there's really, in the course of, uh, that's 1986, this one. In the course of three years, the, uh, the movement has been uh, really amazing. Uh, this, I would, uh, the Poussin's birthday, I would uh, characterize as uh, noisily uh, joyous. And uh, but uh, consolidated light and power, I would call symphonic. And of course, the big difference is uh, here, all the color is local. And the space is built up. Uh, you'll notice uh, there's tremendous relief. And uh, there's space uh, uh, to the left and right. Uh, but uh, it, it's a kind of piling up of forms. And uh, uh, there are these jumps from one uh, thing to another. They're exciting, they're fun, but I think this shows a much uh, higher level of uh, conceptualization and, and um, execution. Uh, color and space are one. Uh, they're indistinguishable. And uh, if you will recall, uh, in the 60s, everybody was talking about how painting was dead, and uh, that's certainly what Donald Judd said. And I remember thinking to myself, well, maybe you're dead, Donald Judd. Uh, 
how, uh, and you remember that um, where painting had been, you started getting these very klutzy, uh, big constructions. In other words, uh, where you had um, uh, space uh, was uh, being depicted, you had, what replaced it was something that was taking up space. Um, but uh, if you wanted, uh, I, my feeling was that all those people uh, were actually taking the word of their elders. Uh, they had so uh, defined painting out of existence, they didn't know how to um, find their way back into it. Uh, of course, if you wanted to go more deeply into painting, you had to go more deeply into yourself. You also had to be very, very patient. Um, uh, these things are not uh, uh, achieved in a day. Uh, I have a little note here. Uh, they said it couldn't be done, and they also said it shouldn't be done. Now this is also a, from 1986. Uh, this is currently homeless. I have my hopes for it. It's called El Teatro de la Grandeza. Um, and uh, it, um, that's a phrase that we used to be applied to Madrid, the theater of the nobility, of the uh, grandees. And um, what I've, how's this for space? Uh, it's the return of the repressed, right? And uh, uh, I feel that this is a um, synthesis of uh, Picasso and Matisse. And uh, this moves the conversation along uh, by about 40 years. Uh, alas, uh, this is reversed. Uh, I don't think we need to uh, change it. Uh, but um, uh, I like to think of uh, maybe Matisse and Picasso uh, squaring off against each other in this kind of uh, tango. Uh, and, uh, but the, uh, again, uh, space is, uh, uh, is color and color is space. Uh, I, uh, where I dream of this ending up is the Chicago Art Institute. I would like people to process from Seurat's La Grande Jatte, Matisse's By the River, and then to this. I think that would be a nice, um, I think that would be a nice progression. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, I was, uh, uh, shortly after the Museum of Modern Art opened, I was, someone was kind enough to uh, invite me to spend an hour or two in there before the uh, public was let in, and I came across a uh, Jasper Johns in one of the corridors, which I haven't seen uh, there since, and I, I had the feeling that it must have been one that I had read about, uh, which they had recently bought for $3 million. And um, I was very struck by it because uh, it wasn't uh, a very large painting. I'd say it was about six feet high. And uh, it had Harlequin um, a pattern on it, uh, which I thought uh, uh, positioned it nicely in the collection. After all, those, those uh, Picassos. And there's a wonderful Harlequin from 1915. However, right in the center uh, was a um, uh, two two by fours each one probably about four feet long, and they were crossed like this. And they were attached uh, to the surface uh, by a bolt and a wing nut, and then there was a little bit of string uh, dangling down. Well, have you ever uh, seen a, uh, um, a uh, driveway in front of a city garage and it says, no parking, don't even think about it? And uh, looking at that, I thought to myself, well, uh, you know, uh, this is, uh, one is being denied access to painting. Now, this is the official art of our time. This is the official shutting down of pictorial space. I often think the uh, art world is very much like, if you ever go to the beach on uh, a hot uh, summer day, you see everybody there on the sand. They're eating, they're talking, they're having a great time. How many people do you see in the water? The young, the frisky? Uh, do we have the same situation here? How many people want to plunge in to pictorial space? Have you ever seen a cat uh, just walk into a strange room? See how slowly it proceeds, looking to left and right? That's, that's an animal response, and I think that um, there's always a great reluctance to dive in.
Now, I'd like to, uh, we've been talking about Rome, and uh, I'd like to give you a, a little tour of my own private Italia, and uh, paintings which have been inspired by uh, Italian art. I can't imagine myself without Italian culture, the music, uh, the architecture, uh, the painting. I know even in the, 18, in the 1960s and 70s, I took great consolation from the Italian movies. I was always looking forward to Fellini and Visconti and Antonioni. I felt, uh, I felt much less alone when I saw those things. Now, the painting on the left is called uh, Look Up and lived, that, Live. That's a kind of tongue-in-cheek title in um, my childhood days. There was a syndicated column which appeared uh, in the local newspaper. It was a inspirational. I don't recall ever reading it, but it was written by Norman Vincent Peale, and I'm sure that uh, might be a name some of you recognize, Marble Collegiate uh, 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 Church on uh, uh, Fifth Avenue. Anyway, it's tongue-in-cheek, and of course what I'm evoking here uh, is this, uh, those wonderful Baroque ceilings. Uh, of Italy. You know, if you spend a little time in Rome, you'll end up very quickly with a crick in your neck. Right up at the top, you see, I've put this little wafer. Uh, that was it. Lure the eye up there, rest there, and uh, feel all this, uh, this uh, lift. And um, uh, I was, when I did that, I was really thinking about um, uh, Raphael's Disputa, uh, in which everything is revolving around uh, uh, the disputa is a, the discussion of the nature of the host. And on the high altar, there's a ciborium in it, is this tiny little wafer. And uh, that really was a conscious illusion. Uh, uh, the one on uh, the right is called Bifocal Bender. Again, uh, uh, this is uh, one of my looking up uh, paintings. It's like looking up into one, uh, it's a 20th century version of a, um, a glory. And uh, you feel that uh, rush and explosion of energy. Now, uh, the one on the left is from 1983. It's quite large. It's nine feet tall. And Bifocal Bender is from 1989. It's not nearly so big. It's 46 inches by 47. Now, what this is, uh, there was an article in the Housing Garden about my apartment. And of course, uh, when you think of uh, Italy, you think of frescoes. And I, I really think it's the ideal uh, condition of painting. Uh, you have the comfort of a wall. You have the comfort of shelter. But then painting makes it go away. And uh, when I did this, uh, it really changed my life because uh, it meant that I had it finally uh, would cease to live in uh, the real estate dream world, always thinking about where else I might live, and had accepted uh, where I was going to live for the rest of my life. Now this uh, has changed uh, down here, but this has uh, uh, remained the same. I had just uh, finished uh, murals uh, for, Ch for the ridiculous uh, theatrical company down on Sheridan Square, so the juices were flowing. and. Uh, uh, that was for Charles Ludlam, and uh, Henry Gelsor called me up to congratulate me, and I said, you know, it's it's amazing, you know, what you would do for somebody else, but you wouldn't do for yourself. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'd never paint murals for myself. And he said, why not? So I hung up the phone. And I thought, well, why not? <laughs> and so this is like um, uh, this is like being in a room in uh, midsummer, uh, all year round. Now, to continue our tour of Italy, uh, this is Venice. Uh, on the left, uh, this painting is called Venice Burns. It's from 1980. It's 56 inches by 49 inches. Uh, it's owned by a couple. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's out in um, East Hampton, so it has, it's in beautiful light. She is a dealer in Italian drawings. That's just one of, uh, uh, something like that makes you think you been living the right life uh, when it all comes together in that way. I, I call it Venice Burns because it has this smoldering quality. Uh, Tintoretto was a great favorite of mine, and um, I think it has um, uh, something of that quality in this. Uh, you see, this is uh, alizarin, uh, crimson, and uh, uh, reds, and uh, this blue. Uh, anyway, 
to me, it's very Venetian. And on the right, uh, the, this painting is called The Venetian Outlook. Uh, this is one of my looking down paintings as opposed to looking up. And uh, I must say, w with uh, most of these titles, you know, I must tell you, they're ex post facto. I don't start out with them. They're really, in, they're really uh, interpretations. I get to be a little bit of a critic, too. And uh, uh, this made me think of Venice, the aquatic side of Venice and the Venetian Empire. Uh, this is uh, not a large painting. It was done in 2003. It's uh, 24 inches by 36 inches. It took weeks and weeks uh, to do. Uh, these emerge uh, from the process. Uh, the painting on the left is called, uh, called Baalbek. Uh, Baalbek is the name of the imaginary resort that the narrator, Marcel, of um, Remembrance of Things Past, uh, spent his summers at. Uh, this struck me as being a very summery painting. I did this in 2000, and the one on the right followed it, also done in 2000. It's called Throne of Light. Well, um, uh, they're both... Um, uh, five feet uh, uh, wide, um, obviously uh, differing heights. Um, having done these two, I went back. I'd already put the titles on the back. But after Baalbek, in parenthesis, I put Venice for this one. And for this one, I put in parenthesis Florence. Well, this golden, glowing, uh, rather foliate, uh, painting all of this soft light. Uh, this struck me as being very Florentine, the hard edges, uh, these hot pinks and uh, yellows and blues, uh, the sort of colors you see in the Trecento and Quattrocento. In fact, uh, right now in the Fra Angelico show. Uh, we're moving down the peninsula. Uh, the painting on the left is called Roughing It, R-U-F-F. ING. So you see it was this big rough. Uh, on a, a wall of our living room when I grew up, there was a photograph here of the a courtyard of the Bargello. Uh, you know, when you're a child, uh, these things are there. You never question. You have no, you accept them. You don't necessarily know what they are. Of course, flipping through a book um, later, I discovered uh, that it was the courtyard of the Bargello. The Bargello is the museum, a sculpture museum in Florence. And uh, it's a very ancient medieval building, but on the inside in the courtyard, there's a Renaissance uh, arcade around it. And this is directly based on that. This is the first thing I put in the painting. It was never touched. And it's that arcade with the light coming down. And I thought, it, looking at it, I thought, well, it looked like, a, a, almost like a head. And you know that thing when you get a, a good idea, that feeling of, of light uh, coming in through the top. And then I put this rough around it. Now, the painting on on the right is called Imperial Springtime. And, and the empire here is not the Roman one, but the Chinese. I had been looking at uh, Chinese embroidery. And these uh, colors are very much uh, the colors you would see in Chinese embroideries. But this a painting is very much a tribute to years of study of Italian drapery. And uh, of course, the drapery introduced an incredibly free uh, note into painting. You can put any, co you can make the drapery be any color you want it to be. You can make it be any shape. It's a, it, it introduces tremendous uh, possibilities. Also. Uh, there's something. Or there's always something going on underneath the drapery. There's a figure uh, beneath the drapery, which you see. And then uh, there are suggestions of movement. So there are always a lot of things. And I think this really uh, is a summation of uh, my uh, thinking about that. And I, I regard this as one of my uh, finest uh, paintings. Now, here's a very classical theme. Uh, this is called Jupiter. And Io, uh, you remember that Io appeared to uh, 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 Jupiter appeared to Io as a Io as a cloud, and you see this green creeping over, and uh, these could be legs. Oh, let's not. I'm not going to spell it all out for you. Uh, this um, was uh, calling it this was, uh, uh, you know, something. I, I saw this all when it was done, uh, but you could see this also as uh, a Jupiter uh, come swirling down, and uh, 
this, um, this is what uh, the French used to call a machine. In other words, it's got lots of parts, and they're all made to mesh and uh, uh, link up with one another. The painting on the right is called uh, uh, the Libyan Sibyl. Ye yes, uh, named after you know the Sibyls and the Sistine ceiling. Uh, when I left uh, the institute, my doctoral thesis was um, had been chosen, and I was going to write on the drawings of Michelangelo for the Sistine ceiling. And um, I got quite a long way into this, uh, but I would say about two thirds of the way, I really thought, ah, Libyan Sibyl. Now you see, think of this as the skirt. This would be the waist. Now, let me, I don't know if you can see me up here, but the Libyan Sybil, this is the, this is the pose. You see them like this. It's like this. There's turns at the waist. And uh, you could even see that as a head. And these is the arms. Um, these things simply emerge. I'd, I'd like to ask you to take a little space walk, uh, walk out on this wharf way back to that little dot. And then you come swinging back down. This is a different blue than this. This is French ultramarine. This is ultramarine green shade. How is this for plasticity? Look at the way this, uh, this blue is so far back. That whole corner is pushed way, way back. And then this comes surging out. Uh, uh, I call this uh, a compositional contrapposto. Uh, uh, you, you maybe have, uh, realize by now that I, flat painting is really not my thing. And um, what I think uh, has to happen is that as, as your eye moves up, uh, the sides, the edges of a painting, those edges should be moving back in space or advancing. And that is, that is counterposto and that makes for excitement and it energizes uh, every square inch of the canvas. There isn't anything left over. Uh, everything is uh, animated, and also it means that uh, everything is functioning both as window, uh, as space, but also as ground, as sh uh, I mean uh, shape, as a figure. <coughs> and so that uh, uh, in watching, uh, uh, you, you heard me, in watching these paintings, they, they, they do, uh, they're like music, they evolve in time, they constantly change. Uh, we've had an awful lot of art that, uh, bang, you see it, and then it gradually fades. Uh, I think art of enduring interest, enduring, enduring interest, and enduring uh, interest, uh, uh, evolves, uh, changes as you look at it, and that is endlessly captivating. Now, the painting, oh, can we turn that off for a minute? Uh, the one on the right? Thank you. Uh, this is called Roman Glory. I suppose that purple. Uh, but um, uh, this is from 2004. And um, I suppose this, uh, when it comes to glory, it's as much the music of Respighi, a brass trombone, French horns. And uh, uh, it just struck me as uh, being wonderfully uh, a Roman uh, carnival splendor and uh, animation. Now, I had the great good fortune of spending a month in Rome as a guest at the American Academy. Uh, that meant that I wasn't working, so I could be a full-time tourist. But what was nice is I could come home at night and have a companionship and uh, not get strung out and each day go out and look at something new. Uh, uh, this is the first painting I did after coming back. Uh, it's from 1995. It's 60 inches by 66 inches. It's down in Houston. I consider it one of my finest works. Uh, what I've done here is you get all of this bravura a painting, as you see, but look at these, look at this knife edge precision. Uh, you, you usually don't get uh, things, um, uh, you, you never see these things uh, together, and I was very proud of that. When I got home, there